Today, we stop at the 24th Psalm to figure out where on earth the hill of the Lord has gone. coffee with Kramer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Kramer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. Obviously, today we're going to be doing a scripture show. That's not always the case. We talk about a lot of other issues. You can find those episodes at barrycreamer.com. And if you've been listening to those episodes and you realize how long it's been since we've done a scripture show, or you haven't even heard us do one of these where we just go through a passage of scripture, then I would also encourage you to go to barrycreamer.com and look at the link to devotionals because you might. Uh, gain some insight or value in the things that I'm trying to do or what we're trying to accomplish with the podcast uh, just by looking at the devotionals. Those are based, by the way, on the uh, on a memo I send out on Monday mornings to our staff and faculty uh, just to encourage them to stay grounded in their work at Criswell College, where I'm the president. So uh, this today, though, is a scripture show on the 24th Psalm, which is a psalm of David. And so what we need to do in looking at this psalm, just like we normally do, is read through the passage first. It's short. It's 10 verses. And you'll recognize the psalm as we're reading through it. Uh, Like a lot of passages, I think you'll recognize distinct portions of the psalm, maybe not all of it together. Even though it's only 10 verses, there are three parts to this psalm that are so distinct, it's as if three different concepts have been crammed together. Now, in reality, the way they're put together, the way they're synthesized is the point, obviously, Uh, and we will be deriving that as we're working through reading it today. So first, just a reading through this Psalm of David, Psalm 24, starting in the first verse. The earth is Yahweh's. in, In this passage, in this Psalm, as we're reading through it, each time I say the Lord, it's Yahweh. So the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world, and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Those are the first two verses, completely distinct, starting in verse 3. The second section, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart and does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Those are the first two sections now. Third section, starting in verse 7. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, he repeats, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, and the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Those are the 10 verses of the psalm, and you you have three completely different sections, and hopefully you picked that out as I was reading through it, but in the first two verses, you have this statement about all of the earth belonging to the Lord. In the second section, verses 3 through 6, you have these questions about how we find the place where the Lord is, which is a completely different idea than the Lord owning the whole earth. The whole earth is his, but then there's this hill of the Lord that's somehow special, and we're supposed to search for it, those who seek the face of the God of Jacob, who is the Lord of the whole earth. So it's very, it's a, it's a, it's a, disjoint in the way they are presented together. Obviously, it's deliberate. And then the last part of the psalm has to do with Yahweh coming to the place that is his. So the gates need to lift up their heads. The doors need to open up and receive the one who is returning to them. And yet the earth is already his, and the hill of the Lord 
already belongs to him, wherever that is. And so what I want to do is read through, at a very basic level, just read those three sections and understand what's happening in them, because there's a concept that's present in each of these little sections that should be obvious to us. I think we're probably aware of it to some extent, but maybe not as precisely or as thoroughly as we should be aware of it. Uh, and if we are, then it makes it really easy to kind of understand where he's going with the psalm. So in the first two verses, the concept is pretty basic. Yahweh is the creator. Yahweh is the ruler over everything. So because he's the creator, he owns all things, and in his ownership, he rules all things, right? So the earth is Yahweh's, and everything in it belongs to him. That's the opening line. The earth is Yahweh's and the fullness of it the world and those who dwell therein. And that way of describing the world is fairly common. We've talked about it before in terms of the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Uh, when you're naming the creation, you use the, the container, so to speak, the earth, the cosmos, and you say, okay, in the container, though, all those things that are present in it belong to whoever owns the container. So if you've got the shoebox, you get whatever's in the shoebox. And God owns the shoebox of the creation, and everything in the creation is his. So the earth is Yahweh's and the fullness thereof. The world and all those who dwell in it belong to him. That's the idea. And then in the second verse, there's something that almost seems anomalous to us or, or maybe parochial. Like, yeah, well, they would say this, but who else would think this way? For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. It almost sounds mythical in its language, you know, like you would expect some uh, pagan religion to say this. You know, so our God established things on the rivers or the waters, and so he's this great God of our little region or something like that. But it's not communicating that. It's something so much more powerful than that, which we'll come back to in a moment. But the basic concept of this is an appeal to the creation itself. So the idea in verses 1 and 2 is that the earth is Yahweh. So here's a declaration, just a, a statement. Like If it were being given by a ruler, it would be given by fiat, uh, as if Nebuchadnezzar were declaring, now Yahweh is our God, by my fiat, because I am the king. So the declaration is the earth is Yahweh's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell in it belong to Yahweh. That's the declaration. But the grounding is what's given in verse 2. And oddly, this is a really great grounding. The grounding in verse 2 is that Yahweh is the one who established it on the seas, who founded it on the rivers. And he says that in the opposite order, obviously. He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. The point is that he's the one who created the dry land on the waters. So as the spirit was brooding above the waters and the light had been created, it was God who separated the dry land from the waters and created this world. And in their conception of it, and it's a reasonable conception as we think about it, in their conception of it, that description of the world is simply the heavens, the earth, and the sea. The heavens are above, the earth is where we live in this, this land here, and then the sea is everything that's below. That's why the sea is the deep. And so in their conception of it, the above, the present, the where we are, and then the below is the heavens, the earth, and the sea. And so the heavens are left out of this part of the description. That's Yahweh's throne room anyway in their, their way of thinking. And so as the earth is here and the earth was founded upon the seas, all we need to know is the earth belongs to Yahweh because he's the one who put it on the seas. He's the one who gave us this land to live in to begin with. And so in the, in the same way that Genesis 1 would say, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and we know that means he created everything, in the same way the commandment to observe the Sabbath day says, you know, in six days you labor and you do all your work, but in the seventh day you rest, because in six days God created the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And on the seventh day, he rested. When he says the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, declaring that all those things belong to Yahweh because he's the one who created them and that we follow his pattern and work only in those six days because we belong to him as well. We are contained in the thing that's his. All of that is the ideology that's below the, the first two verses of Psalm 24. The earth belongs to Yahweh because he created it. 
and the earth belongs to him because he's the one who put it on all of those waters that are below. So everything everywhere belongs to him. That's the concept concept that's present in the first two verses. Obviously, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof of the world and all those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. The second concept that's present in verses three through six almost seems contradictory to it, which is who shall ascend the special place that belongs to the Lord? Well, the whole earth is the Lord's and all the fullness of it belongs to him. So why are we searching for a hill that belongs to the Lord? And the answer is fairly simple, and it's not truly contradictory. Uh, It doesn't create a real contrast, but it does create a a questioning, a tension, a reason for asking why we would need to seek for the hill of the Lord when every hill belongs to the Lord. All the hills are his, and all the cattle on all the hills are his. So why are we seeking for the hill of the Lord? In, In everyone's conceptions throughout all of history, and I mean this is true, in every culture, everywhere, all of the time, there are sacred spaces. There are places where we recognize the importance of God's presence there. So the Pythia in ancient Greece is typical of this. Uh, On a mountaintop with the caves nearby, and then the Pythia who speaks the words of God who is there, and obviously these are pagan images that I'm using, but they're pagan images that reflect a truth about God, that he rules the heavens above, he rules the world where we are, and he rules the world that's beneath us, which is the cave. And so, you know, in cathedral language, it's the steeple reaching up to the heavens and then the sanctuary where the people meet and then the catacombs below where the dead are. All of those images are always present in sacred spaces. They reach up and down, but they're also always centralized somewhere. And so being on a hill... Uh, is an ideal sacred space. There are lots of caves in the hills, and the hills reach up to the heavens, and that, and yet there's land where we can be. A clearing in a woods is a sacred space. A home in the middle of a field is a sacred space. A little house on the prairie, yes, exactly. Sacred space. All of those images of sacred space do the same thing. An island in the middle of the sea. The sea is chaotic and dangerous and wild. And when you find the land in the middle of the sea, that's the sacred place where you're finally safe and so on. So the idea of sacred space is present everywhere. By the way, advertisers know this. If you start watching commercials and pay attention, sacred space shows up in a lot of... The sacred space, by the way, is the car in most car ads, uh, as it turns out, which is why the wilds of the water are trying to get into it. The family find shelter inside the doors of their vehicle. Anyway, sacred space is a normal image throughout history, and the reason for it is not that distant from where we are ourselves. So, uh, in, in uh, you know, we, we, we don't have temples now. We have sanctuaries. We call them sanctuaries. So, we go to a church, and we go into a certain room, Some rooms we go into and we eat. Other rooms we go into and we do other things. Some rooms we go into and we just glad hand and talk and fellowship and all that kind of stuff. And other rooms we go into and we worship. And we call those rooms sanctuaries. They're holy spaces. Well, they're the same kind of space all the other spaces are. I mean, you know, it's concrete and wood and all that kind of stuff. And in Baptist life, you don't have to be Baptist to be this way. Lots of people are this way, too we actually acknowledge from the outset that there's nothing sacred about the space itself. Uh, There's nothing, you know, intrinsic to the space that makes it holy. And yet, we call it a sacred space, sanctuary, and when we go into it, you know, historically, men had to take their hats off in Southern American culture, and, uh, you know, you just, you behaved differently in there. You took on a different tone in your voice and so on. And the reason was it was a space that was set apart for God. Well, that's silly. I mean, we would do that, and then we would take out the chairs and put up a volleyball net and play volleyball in the same space. What were we doing? Well, we're doing something that's universal to human nature, and it's partially what we need to do, which is we recognize that in that space, some of us heard the voice of God when he said, we needed to meet him as Savior, for instance, or we heard God speaking that we needed to change something in our lives, or we recognized that God was calling us to some purpose that we didn't know before. And so when we go into that space, it's not that God speaks there more than he speaks elsewhere. He speaks everywhere all of the time. The issue is that we're not listening everywhere all of the time. And so we set some 
spaces apart, and we say in those spaces, you know, here we're going to remember that God speaks, and we're going to make a special effort to listen to God here because we're not good at listening to him all the time, and if we will focus our effort on it, we might notice that God is doing things if we recognize that this space is designated for giving our attention to it. And by the way, it is not distinct from what God himself said was actually going on with the temple. Even Solomon, when he's dedicating the temple, he doesn't say, and God will actually dwell in the temple. He says, God, we know that the heavens itself, even the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, much less this dinky little house that I have built you. One of the wonders of the ancient world, by the way. No, it's not that. He knows that's not where God actually dwells, but he knows it's where we need to conceive of God being because we need certain places so that we will pay attention to what God is doing everywhere. And so in in ancient Israel, it's the same way. There are certain spaces that are set apart, and how are we going to to, to find them? How are we going to find God? How are we going to, to seek him out? And you can see the parallels in this second section when verse 3 says the question, asks the question, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who will stand in his holy place? This is a question that's asked earlier. I'll come back to it, but it's answered in a different way. In this case, it's not trying to figure out how we get there and stay there. It's just trying to say, where on earth is that? Because the way he concludes that section in verse 6 is by saying, well, the generation of those who seek him are the ones who ascend the hill of the Lord, those who seek the face of the God of Jacob. So the point of this one is to focus on the fact that even though all of the earth belongs to Yahweh, there are only some places where we're actually seeking him. And there, and those places are only sought out by people who are actually seeking him. So something's going on here where God doesn't seem to be present everywhere, but he does seem to be present in some special ways in some places or in some people, whatever the case may be. We're going to come back to that and talk about exactly what that is in verses 3 through 6. So there's this break to talking about sacred space. We'll come back to it in a moment. And then the third section is this lift up your heads, O ye gates, right? So at the end in verses 7 through 10. This is a, obviously a celebratory chant that they would use, that they would, they would repeat in worship with each other in anticipation of the day that God comes back to claim what's his. Now, you know, the hill of the Lord is, is not, it's not a super complicated guess. I mean, in David's day, not only did the people worship in high places, I'm going back to the second section for just a second, for just a moment. Not only did they worship in high places, sometimes well and sometimes poorly, but the point is they went to high places to worship. So saying the hill of the Lord is not a big surprise. But obviously once David takes Zion, everything about the hill of the Lord becomes associated with the hill of Zion, with coming to the sacred city, Jerusalem. And even when David is born, raised in Bethlehem and so on, it's Jerusalem that becomes the great city, the king city, the, the city of, uh, of the hill where the temple itself is going to be built by his son after his death. So the idea, the hill of the Lord, is going to be associated with Jerusalem. But but that's just lightly associated. I mean, it's heavily associated going forward from this, but this is David writing the psalm. So when you read verse 7, lift up your heads, O gates. Now we know we're talking about a city. There's no question we're talking about Jerusalem. Receive the king, Jerusalem. So lift up your heads, O your gates, O you gates. And this is this is metonymy. This is language where you replace one thing with another and you use it as an image. So lift up your heads, O ye gates, is using the gates of Jerusalem as a way to say to all the people of Jerusalem, lift up your heads and see your king come in through the gates that are here. And so lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, O ye ancient doors. There's a reason the doors are ancient in Jerusalem in this psalm as they're being presented. Because remember, at the very beginning of the psalm, the whole premise here is that the earth belongs to Yahweh because he's the one who established it on the seas at the moment of creation. So for the ancient doors to open and receive Jeru- and receive their king is for Jerusalem as a city to open its doors and receive its ancient king, 
the one who was ruling over it from the beginning, whether they knew it or not. But the point is that the king of glory is going to come in. So obviously, by the time we're getting to the end of the psalm, we're talking about a king who has not been present returning. So the psalm opens, and this is the basic structure that we're going to work with now. The psalm opens with us recognizing that the earth all belongs to Yahweh. It's his by creation. The psalm ends with the recognition that one day he's going to return and the gates are going to open and he's going to come with power to claim what's his own, and we should celebrate in recognizing that the Lord of power, the Lord of armies and hosts, strong and mighty, mighty in battle, is the one who's going to return. The thing that's happening in the middle is those who are living in this world seeking the hill of the Lord. So now let's go back and read it in that light that we're talking about saying Yahweh owns the earth, but he has to come back to it at some point. Some, for some reason, he's not here in the way that you would expect the owner of the whole earth to be here. And in the meantime, there are people who are seeking him on his hill. How does that play out, and what does that mean to us? That's what we need to look at. So first, let's take the first couple of verses, and and this won't take very long to go through now that you understand the basic concepts or now that we're all together on what the basic concepts are. Take the first two verses, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell therein, because he's the one who established it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. And if you think, that declaration in verse 2 plays into their worldview. It's saying to them, oh, you think only in terms of regional gods. You think of a God who rules over the plains. Think of the Philistines and, uh, the well, actually just the people who lived in the land who believed that, you know, they had chariots of iron, for instance. We'll, we'll, we'll rule in the valleys. Oh, you know, the Israelites, they have these powerful gods of the hills. Well, that language sounds so trite, you know, for a pagan to say, oh, our gods rule in the valleys, your gods are in the hills. But even the language of Israel sounds like that sometimes. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from Yahweh, as if Yahweh is in the hills and not in the valleys. Now, I'm not saying the psalm means that. I'm saying you can understand how that would be a residual concept in people's minds who believed that there were parochial gods. There's a god over this area, a god over that area, and it just depends on where you are as to which god you worship, and the difference between the areas is demarcated normally by a body of water of some kind. The rivers divide things. Valleys where there are floods divide things. You can't cross the sea without these huge risks, and the seas themselves are these chaotic and primordial sources of division. And so what do you, so how else would you conceive of it? So when for instance, Moses goes to Pharaoh, it's not a surprise that Pharaoh's response is simply to say, I don't know Yahweh. I don't worship Yahweh. We have our own gods. We're not going to worship your God, and I'm not going to let you go worship your God. You're our slaves. But it's Yahweh who tells Pharaoh to let the people go. So when Pharaoh says that, I don't know your God. I don't know who he is, and I'm not going to obey him. It's not a big surprise. When Moses then takes, you know, the st- the, the staff to do the miracles that he does, when he uh, goes through the ten plagues with Pharaoh, it's not just an insult to the gods of Egypt uh, where you're just mocking the gods of Egypt one after another. It is that. I mean, I know that interpretation of it, and I think that's valuable, but it's not just that. He's making the point that the that Yahweh is not a parochial God of the Israelites. Yahweh is God over everything. He is the one who rules all of this land and the Nile River and the Mediterranean and everything else, the heavens above to the earth beneath. Everything is ruled by him. That's the declaration to Pharaoh, this universal declaration of the sovereignty of God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness of it. Yahweh is the creator. Therefore, Yahweh is the one who rules. But when you go forward from there, so when Israel leaves Egypt, what do they have to do? They have to cross the Red Sea, and they're terrorized there. Oh, what are we going to do? The Egyptians are coming behind. We have this sea in front of us. What are we going to do? God puts down his hand to prove that he owns the seas as well. 
when he divides the Red Sea, he is saying, I own all of this, people. I'm the one who put the dry land on it. You do not have to fear, and you don't have to pick which God you're going to worship. I am the Lord over everything. The importance of that, that Abraham, when he's leaving Ur and then leaving Haran, is obeying Yahweh, and he's crossing this river. He's not just crossing a river. He's crossing a threshold to say, you know, Yahweh's going to be my Lord where I go, and so I'm leaving this land behind. Yahweh's not saying, well, this is a, a land with false gods, and so I'm, I'm going to get you to go to a different land where you can worship the true God. He's saying, I'm the God over everything, and so I want you to start crossing these bodies of water and people to recognize that wherever you put your foot, I am Yahweh there as well. Joshua makes this point so that when Israel leaves uh, Egypt and wanders in the wilderness and then finally crosses over to go into the promised land, what he's saying to them at the end of his ministry is a declaration about all the places they have left and all the bodies of water they have crossed and how all of those are an opportunity for them to recognize that they only serve Yahweh. This is how I, he says this. You Look, God is a jealous God. You have to choose who you're going to serve. You have to decide who you're going to serve. Now, therefore, fear Yahweh and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers, I'm reading from Joshua's sermon to the people of Israel at the end of his life in Joshua 24. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river. And beyond the river means where Abraham was. And in Egypt. And instead, serve Yahweh. If it's evil in your eyes to serve Yahweh, choose who you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we are going to serve Yahweh. So, you know, each time, and this is why Paul describes them crossing the Red Sea as a baptism to Yahweh. Each baptism is this point where God is putting us down, and I recognize the rebirth, the resurrection, the power of all those things that are present in the New Testament descriptions of the baptism. The baptism is also God saying, look, when I put you into the waters, I'm putting you into the waters of creation and bringing you out new to recognize that you belong solely to me. You are mine, made in the waters of creation. And so, the heaven, so all things belong to him. That's the first section. It's laid out. When you get to the, we're going to skip the second section of the psalm because that's where we live. We're in the second section. So I'm going to come back to it because it's the part that's most pertinent to us, and that's where we'll close. But the, se- the so the, the second part I want to talk about is the last part of the psalm in verses 7 through 10, where we see enacted what we visualize as believers, as Christians, uh, we visualize as Jesus coming into Jerusalem, right? So a uh, Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry is we, we just associate that with this language. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lift up, you ancient doors, that eastern gate. When Jesus comes through the gates so that he's coming into Jerusalem, we expect the celebration, but we also see that they don't recognize who he really is. In the end, they crucify uh, this king, who I will identify as Paul does in a moment, as the Lord of glory. Paul actually uses the language probably from this psalm, to make the point that they should have recognized who he is. But the point in this psalm is not about the triumphal entry at Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. It's about when he comes back through that gate to declare that all things are his, to really uh, announce his sovereignty in this world and the completion of what he's always been doing. So in verses 7 through 10, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lift up, O ancient doors. Again, the ancient doors saying, Look, from the creation, this is why these doors that belong to a city that is old, but I mean, ancient is powerful language, and he's using the language to say, because the creation belongs to Yahweh. So the gates of the creation have to open up and receive their king again. And when they do, Paul knows this is talking about Jesus. We should know this is talking about Jesus. The same things that are fulfilled in Yahweh in these psalms, psalms like this one, are the things that are fulfilled by Jesus. Even the idea that Jesus is given a name which is above every name by a people who know the name Yahweh. Think about what that means. This is who Jesus is. He is the king of glory, obviously. So in 1 Corinthians 2, when Paul is describing 
uh, the things that we do and don't understand in this current world. And this is the, this is the very passage where he's saying that there are some things that none of us know. They're a mystery that none of, us, none of us understand. But then he says, but God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. In that same context, he says, you know, people should have recognized when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem that this was the king of glory returning to claim the city that belonged to him, to declare his sovereignty, which he obviously ultimately does in the power of the resurrection. But in Paul saying this, listen to how he says it. In, this is in the second chapter to the Corinthians, in, in 1 Corinthians. Yet among the mature, we impart wisdom, although it's not a wisdom of this age, people in this age don't understand it, or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and a hidden wisdom of God, who, uh, which God decreed before ages for our glory. Listen, none of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So that when Christ is coming into Jerusalem, they should have recognized this. They should have lifted up their heads. They should have opened their gates. And they did for the moment, but not realizing who Jesus ultimately is, ended up crucifying the Lord of glory, the one who actually does rule over all these things. So we anticipate the day when Yahweh will appear and we will all worship Yahweh. There will come a day that's like that. Why? Because the earth is his and all the fullness of it. And so all of the earth and all of its fullness, the gates and the doors and the people who are behind the gates and the doors will all celebrate his return. We'll all bend the knee and confess that he is Lord. That's what we're recognizing at the beginning of the psalm and at the end of the psalm. But in the interim, where we live right now, we are instead looking for where he is. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? So there is some place designated where Yahweh is still present in this world. Now, again, I don't mean by that that he's not literally present everywhere. He is literally present everywhere. He is speaking everywhere. He is acting everywhere. The world would not exist if he were not breathing it into existence every moment. So I, I absolutely believe in all of that, including the doctrine of maintenance. The, the whole idea here is that we don't see him. And the fact that we ever ask a question, why does this terrible thing happen, is evidence that there is a legitimate gap between what we know is true about God's sovereignty or what we know by faith is true about God's sovereignty and what we know is true about the world by our experience. Something is wrong in the world. And so the question he's asking here, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, is what he's answering in verse 6. Who's going to find him? Who's going to find where this God is who owns the whole earth who you would expect to find everywhere because all of the earth is his and all the fullness of it. You would think that everybody would actually be where William Wordsworth thinks we should be in all of his poems about passing clouds and flowers, you know. Uh, he's a romantic, obviously, so you find God in everything, right? That You would think that that would be true about every person, and yet something's missing. So instead, we have sacred spaces. And what we find in this middle section is where those sacred spaces are and who occupies them. The way this question is asked and answers, answered sounds so much like the 15th Psalm that we might be tended to th t tempted to think that he's giving an answer in exactly the same way. So in, verse, in, in, in this Psalm, the question is, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? And then the answer comes back, well, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Those are verses 3 and 4. Listen to how that goes in Psalm 15. In the first verse, it is, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent, in your sanctuary, right? Who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? And then the answer comes back. And it's an extended answer. I'll just give the beginning of it. He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. You can see he's giving exactly the same kind of answer. But the difference in the 15th Psalm is that the questions in verse 1 are all about the temporary status that we have. So who's going to take up temporary residence in this temporary sanctuary of Yahweh? And then who's going to be able to 
lay down and rest there on his holy hill? And then the final answer comes in the end in verse 5 when he says, he who does these things, as he describes all these requirements of holiness, shall never be moved. That You don't take up temporary residence. You actually find your permanent salvation in him and your permanent place in him. And we realize, and going back to the 15th Psalm, I won't do it right now, but just for those who might only hear this part of the conversation, that the only one who's ever satisfied the walking blamelessly and doing what is right and speaking truth in his heart and meeting all of these requirements is the Messiah himself, which is why we find our refuge in him ultimately. And that's not a, a misspeaking. I mean, that's the whole point of the psalm, that the anointed one is the one who finds his place on the hill of the Lord. But for us, this is not Psalm 15. This, this is the 24th Psalm that we're looking at. For us, the answer is slightly different because the point here is ascending the hill of the Lord. So who is going to approach? Who's going to find worship? Who's going to seek the face of God? Who's going to find God's presence in this world? Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place. And the answer comes back with those who are repentant. Now, we know the Messiah actually does have clean hands and a pure heart. The Messiah actually does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. But the statement here is about the repentance of those who want to seek the hill of the Lord. So in this world where there are unholy places, which is weird because it's a world that was created by Yahweh who owns the whole thing and everything in it, and yet there are these unholy places. Those who are going to seek the holy place of God are those who are repentant, those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who don't lift up their soul to what's false, who do not swear deceitfully to the harm of those who are around them and so on. So those who are repentant in some way. But then verse 5 takes it a slightly different direction. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. You would almost think that what he said in verse 4 is, well, the answer to the question, who shall find the hill of the Lord, is whoever's righteous. But in verse 5, what he receives is righteousness from the God of his salvation. And those two concepts go together, you know, throughout all of his, Israel's history, obviously. So you don't go into the temple uh, carrying your sins with you in your actions of sinfulness in the moment. You carry them in having repented and bringing a sacrifice to say, I am unworthy, I am unrighteous, I cannot be received into the holy presence of God, and yet I'm coming and asking for grace. And so in repentance and grace come those who ascend the hill of the Lord who stand in his holy place. And that's the message of salvation that we obviously carry into the New Testament as well. But you find that, and by the way, a great link to understand how the repentance and grace go together in these concepts in the Psalms is present in the same idea in a Davidic Psalm, going back to the second Psalm. This is the 24th that we're looking at today. But in the second Psalm, you'll remember that there were kings of all of these different regions who had their areas where they thought they were the ruler, and the God of the heavens is looking down and laughing on them because he's the true sovereign over all things. So in Psalm 2, it is, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, what has he done? I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Ah, here's the hill of the Lord again, with the anointed one on the hill of the Lord. And the answer is, if you want to ascend the hill of the Lord, then you have to know the one God has chosen to put on the hill of the Lord, the only one who actually had a pure heart and or has a pure heart and whose soul does not take, take up that which is false and doesn't swear deceitfully and so on. The, the Messiah. And so in repentance and grace, we seek him. And so he says, I will tell of the decree. This is after the statement in Psalm 2. He says, after the statement, I have set my king there on Zion. I have set him on my holy hill. This is how we, in this Psalm, Psalm 24, receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is what he says in Psalm 2. I set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, this is the king on the hill saying it, you are my son, Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I'll make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth are your possession. 
So the Messiah owns the whole earth as the testimony that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, even in a world where that Messiah is ruling from the holy hill. Who can ascend that holy hill? The one who is repentant and seeking grace, the favor of the Messiah that Yahweh has put in place on top of this mighty hill. This is the idea that's being conveyed. And then the the, the statement in verse 6 is simple. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. The image is so powerful because what he's communicating is Yahweh created the world and owns the whole thing. From one end to the other, there is no place where he's not Lord. And yet, we don't see that. There's something wrong in the world. We know things are wrong in the world, including with us. Someday, we know he's going to make that right. We know he's going to march back through the gates and declare his sovereignty absolutely, and there'll be no question about it, and every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in that, all acknowledge that Yahweh is the supreme ruler. And this is exactly how Paul describes what happens with Jesus as he's received the dominion from his father and gives the glory back to his father. All of these things are just a magnificent statement of sovereignty. But here, what is it that happens? And you know, I'll I'll communicate it to you this way. Uh, I had uh, the opportunity to celebrate my birthday recently. It, you know, celebrating is an exaggeration. At this age, you you acknowledge that you have another birthday. You know, when you're young, people celebrate. All right, another year, it's going to be great. You know, now people look at you and go, so you're going to try for another one, are you? Okay, well, good luck with that one. Anyway, so I celebrated, so to speak, uh, my birthday the other day, and my uh, sister and her husband and uh, my mom and my wife, we all went to this uh, nice restaurant in Fort Worth, had a great time there. And we went in, and we sat down at a table, and everybody at the table properly celebrated that it was my birthday. I mean, that's the only day it gets to be about you, right? So your birthday, uh, it's like uh, the whole world belongs to me. So I get to eat what I want. I get to do what I want. It's going to be a great day. So on that day, uh, they sit down at the table, and they give me a card, or they give me these recognitions, you know, that it's a birthday, and a birthday meal, and we're all, and I didn't even have to pay for the meal. So it's like, you know, it's one of those great things, at a birthday. But I'm walking through the restaurant. Nobody in the restaurant, nobody else in the restaurant even cares that I'm walking by. I doubt anybody, when I walked by their table, for whatever reason I may have walked by it, none of your business, uh, I doubt anybody even looked up to notice that someone had walked by. If someone sitting at one of those tables had said, did you see that guy who just walked by? I think most people would have said, who? I didn't even notice anything. And if somebody at one of those tables had happened to notice that happened to know that I had a birthday and had said, hey, it was that guy's birthday, most people in the room would have said, who? Who are you talking about? I don't even know who you're talking about. They had no idea. There was one table in the room who had an idea that it was my birthday, and we were celebrating the birthday. This is, this is what I'm conveying to you this psalm is talking about. All of the earth, well, and, and in that whole restaurant, it was my birthday. It was my birthday, and nobody cared. <laughs> so I'm joking. Obviously, they don't care. It doesn't matter to them. But the earth is not like that. The earth really does belong to Yahweh. It's his birthday. It's his world. He created it. And everybody's just going about their business and eating their meals and ordering their uh, you know, they're entrees, and yeah, we're getting all this time, we're getting ready to pay the check, and oh, we've got this all under control, and somebody says, hey, did you see that God who passed by? And most people go, what God? I didn't even see that there was a God. What, what God are you even talking about? The people we are in that world are the ones who are sitting at the table who know it is his world, and we are celebrating that it is his world. We are repentant of what we were when we didn't know it and didn't act like it, and we are seeking his grace and favor in every moment. And if no one else in the world knows it, on our little hill, at our little table, when we're together, when we're worshiping together, when we're serving together, when we're sacrificing together, when we're on mission together, we are acknowledging that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And everywhere we are, That is the hill of the Lord. Everywhere, this is why Paul says, you are the temple. Where was the temple? On the high place, in the city, which was the hill. 
the holy hill of God. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit who ascends the hill of the Lord. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. May we be that generation in this generation. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Creamer. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. <laughs> Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at barrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.